Hey everyone, my name is Sarah LaVon and welcome back to my YouTube channel. I am back for this month's Coffee and Questions where we answer your questions from Instagram and YouTube. Most of you who have been around here for a while, you know that if you comment down below, that's typically where I look for next month's Coffee and Questions, but I'm also scrolling through all of my previous YouTube videos to check out what questions you have from those videos. So I will reference other videos and send you there because there's so much content on this channel. There's so much going on in other places like Instagram or my website. I'll link everything in the description box down below. I'm not entirely sure what questions are gonna come up today. I am winging it, but if you are curious, you can also check out the description box down below and look at those chapters and they will let you know the questions we're tackling today. But before I do that, make sure you subscribe down below, give it a like, share it with a friend, and then let's get answering your questions. So the first question, we're gonna go from Instagram and knock those questions out and then head on over to YouTube. Most of the time I spend probably more time on Instagram questions. I think today I'm gonna to lean more on the YouTube side. So if you have a question, just ask them in all the places and then I may see it. So. Danny Ferris 13 says, getting pregnant less than six months after a C-section, risks. So the general recommendation of, of spacing between pregnancies from the time of birth to conception is 18 months. Now, not everybody has 18 months, depending on when your first baby was, depending on how many babies you want, and sometimes you just get pregnant. So I think I hear a lot of times like, oh my gosh, I'm pregnant so much earlier than I'm supposed to be. And flex and flow, you can kind of look around the world and realize that like there's a lot of people that are spaced closer together. Most of the time it doesn't mean much. Now, with a C-section in particular, the goal with that 18 month number is so that the scar where the incision was on your, on your abdomen, but really, that's what we think about, it's actually the uterus inside the abdomen that we care mostly about because we want that scar like so tightly fused together that it's stuck because one of the biggest risks, if not the biggest increased risk of somebody who's had a C-section and then has a vaginal birth after that, what we call a VBAC, vaginal birth after cesarean, is that that scar, as the pregnancy grows and as they're in labor and there's contractions on the scar, it starts to separate. And that is called a uterine rupture. If you want more on that, I have an entire VBAC class on my website, I'll link it down below. And then there's also two VBAC videos that are in the VBAC playlist. I even have a playlist for you VBAC mamas because you are super special to me. And so now that you are pregnant, we are excited about your pregnancy. There's no going back. We are going to just pray that that, that scar fuses um, and a little bit higher risk of uterine rupture, but really the risk is not, not that much greater. Congratulations. This is actually from the same person. Danny Ferris 13 says breastfeeding. Tried all the advice and could not produce more than one to two ounces per day. Why is that? So I think there's, okay, so one of the things, and this, I have like a whole breastfeeding series coming in my head. Maybe I'll turn it into a class. Not totally sure because there's so much we could talk about with breastfeeding. So if you haven't subscribed and maybe you're getting towards the end of your pregnancy, make sure you do because I intend to get there eventually. There's just so much to talk about. So I think one of the things that I say because, and the point of this is that I hear constantly when I ask people if they intend to breastfeed, do they want to breastfeed? And the answer is always, if I can breastfeed. It's also, that goes for other contacts in labor and birth. If I can deliver vaginally, if I can go without an epidural, right? Those are usually the big ones. And so with that, sort of if you've been around here, one of my scripts is you never know until you try. So that's a piece of it. But with breastfeeding, breastfeeding is designed to work. Now, is that work easy? No. Breastfeeding is like your second labor. Breastfeeding can be very challenging. In fact, I hear all the time that sometimes breastfeeding is more challenging than labor strictly because it's like labor is kind of like in this short amount of time versus breastfeeding is like over months and months and months and it changes and now I'm going back to work and I'm pumping and my baby has different needs and supply stuff and I'm trying to lose weight or whatever it may be, okay? So I wanna just say verbally out loud that I usually tell people you have milk. You've had milk since week 14 to 16 of your pregnancy, especially if your breast changed in size, you haven't had any breast surgeries, and really I'm talking about a reduction. Even with implants, that shouldn't in impact your breastfeeding. Um, and then there are 
very, very few instances where people actually can't breastfeed. Most of the time, and I'm talking general and and um, Danny, I'm gonna I'm gonna talk to you specifically in one second, okay? But I have to talk general first because there's so many people here. And so, but in general, I feel like people don't have enough support, they don't have enough education, and breastfeeding takes a lot of perseverance that almost everyone, and if you are that easy person, then I'm so happy for you, but in general, it's probably more normal to have some struggles and then have to push through them, and then there comes a point where you're like, I don't know if I can keep going. And you either choose to keep going or you don't. And those that keep going, it's like that constant like push-pull of the, the struggle that breastfeeding can be for some. And it's beautiful in its own ways, but it also can be really challenging. And so that's my basic like disclaimer because for most of you when you are concerned about breastfeeding, most of the time it's you need to see a lactation consultant, there might be something else going on, you do a little fix. Can't tell you how many times I've gone to a postpartum visit or a friend's house in the postpartum period, they're having all these issues, I assess their latch, I make micro adjustments and next thing you know they're breastfeeding for like two years, okay? So those little changes, you just need the right support and the right education behind it. Now, for someone who is saying that she did all the advice, she took all the advice, she saw multiple lactation consultants, in fact, I can think of a client here that saw like three different people and did everything, like supplementation and all the strategies, all the tricks, tried so hard to breastfeed and it didn't happen. And this is where too, so I say all of that because the majority, the majority of you can breastfeed. It's not necessarily an issue, but there are a small population of people. We don't know why. It could be just the glandular tissue in the breast that they actually don't have enough of the like structure to support breastfeeding, but we may not ever know why. And sometimes you don't produce a ton. And so what I say with that is if you've done it, you've been giving your heart and soul to this baby and to the work of breastfeeding, you've gotten the expert advice. It There comes a point in my mind where like uh, it's enough is enough and there's nothing worth your mental health. And so for you, we want to celebrate those one to two ounces that you are able to create for your baby. You're going to give those to your baby. You're going to try your best. You're going to determine what feels right for you as far as like, is this too much for me? Is this just so discouraging that I can't keep going? That's okay, okay? There are lots of other resources out there and formula is not the end of the world. We have it as a tool if needed, okay? And so I don't necessarily have an answer for you as, as far as why can't, why can't you make more than that, but it does sometimes happen. And if it does, we celebrate what you got and it, it is sort of just the way that life is, right? We are not always given the cards that we want, but we're gonna make the best of whatever situation it is. No shame in that game. There's nothing worth your mental health. Blueberry86247 says, if you bled heavily during one delivery, can you again? The answer to this is yes. If you bled and bled heavily, really the question for your provider is, was it considered a postpartum hemorrhage or was it just you felt like you bled heavily, but it was still within the range of normal? Um, it's expected to bleed, it's okay to bleed, but a hemorrhage is what we're trying to avoid. And if you hemorrhage with your first, you do have a slightly higher chance of hemorrhaging again with a second or subsequent pregnancy. Valerie Rose, 1994 says, tips to naturally induce labor, when can I start doing them? So I have two videos on this. They are old videos, oldies but goodies, because the info in that video is probably still applicable. I will make just a couple of little comments. One is, the question is, can you induce labor naturally? And the SparkNotes version of the first video is, not really. If your body's not ready, you can do everything in the world and stress yourself out and really it doesn't mean much and you may not end up in labor and just end up frustrated. But if your body is on the cusp of going into labor, you are very close. Sometimes you can do some things, kind of push you over that edge and then help kind of push labor forward. Now, induction is truly not really possible naturally in my 
a humble opinion, only because I've seen this a few thousand times. <laughs> and an induction truly is like medication or a Foley balloon. I also have two videos on that you can check out. How to induce labor naturally is the first one, and then how they induce you in the hospital is another one. And there's a stark difference between the two. The second one is more guaranteed to do so because we're actually doing what labor does or mimicking what labor does on its own. Versus you're, with a natural induction, you're trying to stimulate your own hormones, but if your own hormones aren't ready to be functional in your body, then it may not work as well for you. So um, tips for naturally inducing labor. Now, here's where my recommendation over the last two years for my clients for helping set their body up and helping get them into labor has shifted a little bit. And so I might have to do an updated video on this, actually. Let me know if you want it as an official video below. But all the engage the baby techniques that I talk about in my engage the baby video, the goal would be that once you hit 37 weeks, that your mind starts getting into a place of softening thoughts, opening thoughts, relaxed thoughts, because the more stressed out you are, that adrenaline in your body actually impedes your labor hormones from working. So decreasing stress, relaxation, and then you're softening all the tissues in your pelvic area, stretches, squats. And by squats, I don't mean like strengthening squats where you're like working on your glutes. I mean like getting into a squat position and relaxing and breathing into that squat. Some deep abdominal breathing exercises, um, oh, hip openers, uh, chiropractic, massage therapy. If you have any restriction in there, we want to release that restriction. Sideline release. All of that will help set up your body because the goal would be that we want the baby to settle into your pelvis, put pressure on your cervix. That releases your natural prostaglandin, which tells your oxytocin in your head to like contract now, have more contractions. And they work in like a feedback loop. That is the Spark Notes version of a childbirth class slash the physiologic birth class I teach to nurses. Moral of the story is everything's soft your mind relaxed, and then we want baby engaging into your pelvis. And that to me, physiologically, is probably gonna be the most effective thing you can do to help induce labor naturally. I am Olori. Is it normal for the body to push on its own? I just had my third baby completely natural. Yes, okay? This is called the Ferguson reflex or the fetal ejection reflex. Um, and especially if you have that sensation, once the pelvic floor gets hit and the cervix gets hit, your natural body instinct is to push. And the way your uterine fibers are all put together is to help bring the baby down and out and to really push. So once the baby hits a certain point, if you feel safe, typically that works better, or if it's actually the opposite too, like if you feel uber threatened, then you also, your body's like, ah, I'm scared, get this thing out of me, boom, and the baby like is basically pushed out on your own. So yes, your body has all these innate instincts, reflexes, processes that help to get baby out even without you pushing if it happens for you. So that's really cool that you got to experience that. Ash Zoktik, one N says 35 weeks, baby went from head down to transverse, 36 weeks, baby head down. Can it do it again? I know you're trying to fit in a lot of text in a short amount of time. So sounds like at 35 weeks, your baby was head down. Then it went transverse, which means head down obviously is head down or what we call medically is vertex and then back to transverse and then back to head down. So can it happen again? Yes. Anything can happen. It is a free for all in labor. This is why I love my job so much because you really never know what's gonna happen. In general though, once the baby is head down, you doing all of my engage the baby video, I say the engage the baby video, doing all the engage the baby exercises from that video is gonna help you because if the baby's floating high up in the pelvis, it's not engaged in the pelvis, it, can, it has way more room to flip and flop around and change positions. But once the head, and the head and the pelvis are like a puzzle piece, so once it's engaged and low, it's gonna be kind of locked into that pelvic area and gonna have a harder time moving out of that position. Babies love being head down because eventually they run out of space. They're like, where do I go? Oh, oh, oh. Also the head's the heaviest part, so the gravity like zoom, brings it down, hopefully. If it doesn't turn head down or the baby is transverse or breech, which is this way, there's probably a reason for it. It could be structural, it could be something's in the way, it could be a short cord, it could be a cord that's like preventing it from trying to go head down, et cetera. 
We don't always know, but the goal would be once they're head down that you engage the baby so it kind of keeps them there, but really anything can happen. Let us know how it goes. Lauderdale Creative says, experience with two cord vessel baby. So a two vessel cord baby. So what that means is, in the umbilical cord, there are three vessels in a normal cord. There's two arteries and one vein. The vein is gonna be the big one. The two little arteries are the little guys on the side. Sometimes you have what's called a two vessel cord, which means you have one artery, one vein. They're gonna be watching for, the biggest thing is really growth and then what we call perfusion. What perfusion is, is just the blood flow to the baby because you can imagine, you have one less vessel, there's a little less blood flow to the baby. Does it mean much? Usually not, okay? Usually I hear that as a labor and delivery nurse, you come in, I go, okay, cool. Has there been any growth restriction? Have they been watching the growth and there's an issue with the baby's growth, which equals and can indicate that the placenta is not giving the nutrients, AKA oxygen to the baby, which are, I said AKA, but like really it's like nutrients and oxygen, they're not the same thing. But you get both of those things to the baby and then that that's something they'll be watching because we want your baby growing. That means that they're, they're attached well to the lifeline, okay, which is the placenta. So usually it means nothing. If they're growth restricted, you could be looking at maybe an induction, um, but I would say, I don't know if I can even think of a case in my history with you know, all these births that I've been a part of where it's been affecting their outcome and it's like, okay, cool, and then that's it. And then we see it at the end when you cut the cord and we're like, oh look, there's the two vessels. Very good. All right, Jamie Bees says, what is a true knot in the umbilical cord? Is there an untrue knot? That's actually a really good question. How are they treated? So I actually have a video about the cord around the neck and my, my like extra bonus little tips in there. I talk about a true knot, so you can look at that. But the idea with the true knot in the umbilical cord is that instead of it just floating freely all over the place in the uterus, there is literally a knot in the cord and it happens from the flip flop from the movement that we love your baby doing okay but sometimes that not happens now in labor as long as there is movement where the blood flow to baby can still take place it's a loose knot it's fine there is no such thing as an untrue knot that i've ever heard of um it's just called a true knot because that's what they call it rather than just a knot in the cord but i guess like the medical terminology is true knot so the concern is once there's a knot in the cord, unless the baby literally followed the pathway through the knot, like we're actually untying a knot, which is very unlikely because they're very big and the cord is very small, it probably is there, okay? So I wanna know in the comment box down below if you had a true knot and what was the outcome because in labor, if this just kind of like floats around and then the baby comes out and you're like, oh my goodness, there's a knot in the cord, we go, great, that was, a close call because what can happen in labor is you have contractions, baby starts going down, and all of a sudden it gets pulled tight and now it's literally like tying a knot to the blood flow to the baby and it can, and I have seen it multiple times, equal a emergency C-section, okay? So it's not our favorite complication to be honest, but there's no way you will know about it ahead of time. So this is where you can stress about it and honestly there's no point because we don't know what's gonna happen and there would be really very, very, very uncommon to know ahead of time. We would see that on the fetal monitoring when you're in the hospital and we're watching your baby um, on the monitors for how the heart rate's doing. And then usually we don't find out until we get to the operating room, get the baby out safely, and then look and go, whoa, that was our cause of that emergency C-section. Mm. <laughs> this might be a nurse question, I'm not totally sure. Either way, it applies to both nurses and to patients. Sibartowski says, can, sorry if I butcher your names, but I'm going with it. Can low blood sugar in the newborn be treated without being admitted to the NICU? Okay, so low blood sugar. We think about this like in everyday life. If I have low blood sugar, I haven't eaten, what, do you, what starts happening? Start getting a little shaky, maybe really irritable. I know that's my mom, <laughs> that like if you don't eat enough, that you, you start to feel like really hungry, maybe a little lightheaded. Right now, most of our bodies grab from our fat stores or our carbohydrates, our glycogen stores, 
in our body to fuel the body to maintain our blood sugar at a level that is sustainable with life. Now, if you have a condition of low blood sugar or hypoglycemia, or more likely you have type one or type two diabetes or even a gestational diabetes sometimes, that diabetes is a disruption of the regulation of your blood sugar. So if you don't eat, that you may end up with a hypoglycemia or you end up with high blood sugar. And I have two videos on gestational diabetes you can go check out not talking about that but a hypoglycemia in us as as healthy humans no big deal we have like a sandwich or a candy or an apple or something and all of a sudden we feel amazing but for a baby first of all especially a newborn and in some circumstances, they're at higher risk for hypoglycemia because their bodies don't regulate as much. Maybe they haven't eaten yet. And especially if you've had a gestational diabetes, your baby is at higher risk for hypoglycemia. Now, a true hypoglycemia is a medical emergency. I mean, under 20 for you nurses. Okay, this is their symptomatic. Babies will be really shaky. They may not maintain their, their um, temperature very well. It can equal a catastrophic outcome if it is missed, okay? So I'm talking mostly to you nurses because for you as a patient, this is very uncommon. And if you have a gestational diabetes or a diabetes in pregnancy, your nurses will be watching this and you need to make sure they know I have that complication in pregnancy so that they can be watching this particularly in your baby. They will routinely check your baby's blood sugar and that is important because if that sugar gets too low, that, that can mean serious complications, okay? And I mean like death, okay? I hate saying that on this channel, but that's how serious it is. Now, do we ever get there? No, not in the hospital because we're watching for those symptoms, we're paying attention, we're going, what's going on? And it is somewhat routine in certain circumstances to check a blood sugar. This is why it's important. And a little prick on their heel to grab a dot of blood is gonna be better than a catastrophic outcome because we are not able to catch it, okay? So, that's my like caveat because I always have a caveat and I always have to give rants on things. But the question was, can low blood sugar in a newborn be treated without being admitted to the NICU? The answer is yes, in general. I would need a lot more information to totally answer that question well. But the typical line of treatment, if there's low blood sugar, we're not talking under 20. Under 20, they're probably getting an IV with some sugar water into, the, not actual sugar water, like dextrose into their IV, which is sugar in like, Glucose, glucose directly into their bloodstream to bring it up. It is that serious, okay, at those really low levels. But we're watching it before we get there. A lot of times they're symptomatic, they're shaky. You're like, mm, something's going on, I'm gonna check a sugar. Always just check a sugar, get the order for it from your pediatrician and then check it. And then the first line of treatment is breast milk. We have to feed them. And if you're like, I don't know, and they wanna give formula, manually express into a little spoon, suck it up into a syringe and feed it to the baby that way, okay? Especially if they're really wanting to exclusively breastfeed, breast milk is great and they don't need a lot to wait 30 minutes, recheck the blood sugar, and then guess what? They ate. It's like us having a candy. If I have one candy and I'm a little jittery, that one candy is likely gonna be enough to pop me into a normal range, and then you'll wanna be on top of it with feeding your baby. So this also, I think for those of you who are patients who are like, oh my gosh, this hypoglycemia thing, this sounds so scary, it's really not. Put your baby skin to skin, that actually helps regulate their blood sugar, better than being separated from you. And then when they're ready to eat, you have up to five hours. I'm gonna say one to two if you have a gestational diabetes going on, you wanna feed a little quicker. And then you feed them regularly every two to three hours or eight to 12 times in 24 hour period. And it's usually not an issue. This is my last one. And then we're gonna go over to YouTube. Uh, June Bugs and Butterflies says, why do doctors treat big babies as a complication? <laughs> Um, you can watch my big babies video slash any of my old coffee and questions and you know that this is one of, this is a thing, okay? I'm, I'm, I have a lot to say about this. All right, she had a nine pound, six ounce baby, congratulations, unmedicated, meaning without an epidural at 42 weeks. Now she's 17 weeks pregnant with baby number two and her doctor is already talking induction to avoid that. Since I was able to do it before, I don't understand why she's worried about it. Just kind of disheartening. 
I feel like I'm not getting credit for my hard work next time. Okay, so let's all give you credit here, okay? We are gonna celebrate this humongous baby that you birthed without an epidural on your own vaginally. That is amazing. And for those of you that also have, congratulations. For those of you that needed a C-section because it didn't work or you feel disheartened by that, guess what? You birthed a humongous baby and you made it to the end. You created a healthy, chunky baby, which we love. Weight on a baby is actually a really good indication of health, okay? So we're celebrating all births here, but we're particularly celebrating June bugs and butterflies today. Um, and so what I'm gonna say, ab say about that is if you've done it before, you should be able to do it again, okay? What doctors in general, again, I'm not speaking for all doctors in general, the um, vibe I get from doctors and from speaking to all of them is that the concern is really that the baby gets stuck in your pelvis. This is called a shoulder dystocia. I'm pretty sure I talked about this in the last Coffee and Questions where the shoulder, actually once the head is out, like literally outside of your vagina, they try to get this shoulder under the bone here and it gets stuck. This is a medical emergency. This can be really scary. It can cause other complications. I did talk about this recently because I remember somebody telling me that they had to break a clavicle, which is this bone right here. You're like, what is this, your neck bone? There's like a normal word for this, but I call it your clavicle because that's a medical term. But they had to break the clavicle of their baby. Like, not good, not ideal, not the best case scenario, okay? So they're worried about that because that is higher risk when you have a bigger baby-ish, okay? Um, and they're worried about it getting, it not only getting stuck, but then the labor slowing down, et cetera. If you've done it before, you have what's called a proven pelvis. Your pelvis is proven. You can birth a nine pound, six ounce baby. And a nine pound, six ounce baby at 42 weeks gestation, so two weeks over your due date, is still likely, I'd have to look at the graph, is still likely within a normal weight for that gestational age. So your doctor's probably just concerned, playing it safe, I would give some pushback and just say, you know, I feel like I didn't get credit. What are the actual concerns? What are the, what's the actual data? Because my understanding is that I have now a proof proven pelvis. If I've done it before, yes, you can do it again. And I wouldn't be concerned about it. Now, if they're measuring your baby and you're measuring at 12 pounds, that's a different story, right? Now, remember with our weights, they allow for 10% margin of error on either side, which is about a pound. So they could say your, your baby's nine pounds. It could also be eight pounds, which is much more normal sized, or it could be 10 pounds, which is like a very large baby. Okay. Even those nine pounders, eight pounders, they come out and I'm like, whoa, they're so big. And then you weigh them and you're like, they're still only eight pounds. Like the 10, nine to 10, 11, the biggest I've seen is 12, six. That was a really big baby. And so the concern again is that stuck, but I would ask what are the actual risks given that I've already done it? I have a proven pelvis. That's my rant on that. The only way to know if the baby fits through the pelvis is by trying. Ooh, this is fun, okay. So I'm heading over to YouTube and um, this is from an oldie but a goodie. When not to go to the hospital, let me know if you've seen that video. If you haven't, it's really fun. I talk about mucus plugs in that one. Um, the May family says, question, I'm 36 weeks, almost 37 on Tuesday and it's Friday. I've been constipated my entire pregnancy and all of a sudden the last two days I've been pooping like crazy. I've had a huge burst of energy a couple of days ago when I got so tired I napped twice in one day and then this morning I woke up, pooped again and then I wiped in a ton of white discharge, not stringy, a couple of big drops of it in the toilet. Is this my mucus plug? Does it sound like labor is close? Also, I felt nauseous the other day during the day too. What is going on? My last two babies were early. Um, one was four weeks early, the other was three weeks early. My guess is this is one day ago. I cannot wait to hear from you, the May family, as far as what's happening here. Um, especially with the history of earlier babies, like not early preterm babies, but before your due date babies, it sounds like your body is prepping for labor. So what I talk about in my, in my childbirth class, this is my labor prep class, I give you all the signs that are your body's getting ready. And so when I talk in that class, I give you all those signs and some of them are, Loose stool because as you start to have little Braxton Hicks, whether you feel them or not, they're probably happening, it starts to stimulate your intestines. Your intestines are like, ooh, like, ooh. Like when you have cramps, if you have cramps when you're on your period and you have some loose stool, totally normal and expected because of that little bit of movement. The other thing is that that little bit of movement causes you to empty out and naturally create space for baby to come down. The burst of energy as the baby drops, a lot of times it's off your lungs. 
I can breathe again. I have this burst of energy that is also things are starting to settle in. The nausea, hormones are shifting. We like your hormones to shift. We don't want your hormones to be pregnancy hormones. We want them to become labor cocktail of hormones. So all of what's happening is, my guess, is your body is in that early getting ready for labor signs. In fact, this sounds exactly like something my clients would text me. <laughs> like, hey, I'm having these symptoms. And I go, yes. And then in my mind, I'm like, okay, on my radar, make sure my stuff, hopefully it's already in my car, but if it's not in my car, my stuff's in my car. I'm kind of a little bit heightened at night. I'm hearing my texts come in instead of sleeping through them, et cetera, because my guess is labor is coming close, but the only way to know is, is really until labor happens, and then you can look back and go, yeah, that was actually signs that my body was getting ready. All right, so this one is really real, and I so appreciate so many of you on my one of my most recent videos on that's called Heal Your Hard Birth, Traumatic Birth. Um, so this is with Krista Dancy, who is our trauma therapist. She is amazing. We talked birth trauma. Part two is all about grounding techniques and how to do some things to downregulate your nervous system. So I'm gonna read this from somebody who commented, and so many of you have shared your stories, and that to me just means the world. One, it means you trust us. If you're reading those stories of other people, please comment your and send your love, send your hearts, um, because it, it takes a lot of heart and vulnerability to share your stories on a platform like this, and I see them, I see you, and I'm gonna read one here and comment on it because I think it's important to to recognize, okay? I'm 25 weeks pregnant with my second child. My first labor was traumatic. I pushed for three hours and then we decided to do a vacuum assisted birth which resulted in birth injuries. I suffered from a fractured tailbone and separated pelvis. So now I'm frightened to give birth. I would like to give birth vaginally again, but I'm scared. So torn between trying natural again or going for a C-section. Today I'm meeting with a midwife. I'm seeing my chiropractor again because I'm experiencing terrible lower back pain. I'm doing stretches and Kegels twice a day, walking a mile a day at two. I'm literally trying everything I can to think of to prep my body for this birth. Just don't think anything will make me calm, however. Okay, so this is so incredibly layered um, and also really beautiful because this is the humanity of life, right? And unfortunately, people do walk away from their births with injuries or with trauma. And really what I'm hearing here is that yes, there was some physical injury, but also that like, it's the fear, it's the scared, it's the lack of calm, okay? So my first, of course, my suggestion is gonna be to talk to someone. Reach out, if you're in California, reach out to, to Krista. If not, reach out to your OB, get a referral for a perinatal psychologist um, to help you process some of that, to come up with strategies. If you don't have a doula, I am gonna suggest that you find a very therapeutic doula that can help hold your hand through this. Everything is harder when done alone, and that has really good evidence and is protective against future trauma. I love that you're seeing a midwife. I love that you're seeing a chiropractor. If you haven't seen a physical therapist yet, my guess would be that you should go see a physical therapist as well so they can evaluate what's going on with your tailbone, with your pelvis in the past. Um, and I love that you're doing all of that, but I think to me, the question that I'm gonna tackle here is, so I'm torn between trying natural again or just going for a C-section. And so I think a lot of times, like especially there's there's some stigma with C-section, and I will say I'm in LA too, so like there's also stigma on both sides where like, why would you have a vaginal birth? I'm just gonna go in for my scheduled C-section. Or what, you had a C-section? Oh, I had a vaginal birth. And I think we need to just take a deep breath and recognize that birth is hard, that birth um, goes a lot of different ways, that's why I say flex and flow, and that for some, a, a scheduled C-section might be the right choice. You had a fourth degree lac laceration, you had some sort of horrible outcome and so much trauma that the thought of going through anything similar may be really traumatizing again. I think it's easy to judge those situations. And what I wanna say is, is that your experience is your own and that um, you need to go through the process with maybe some professional help, but even just your friends, your family, those that love you to listen and strategize because there is nothing worth your mental health. Are there ways if truly when you get down to the core of it, you're like, no, I really want a vaginal birth. Like I don't want a C-section. I don't want, I don't want surgery. Then now the strategy is strategizing to how do we make that process a lot 
be feeling really emotionally safe, physically safe. What are your limits along the way? What are your triggers along the way that may kind of shoot you back into the previous trauma? Um, and this is why working with a trauma therapist is gonna, to me, be really helpful to help prep with that so that you have those tools on board to help you in those moments. Now, if you decide and you're like, you know what, the thought of a vaginal birth is just horrifying to me, that that C-section feels like the better option, guess what? Sometimes I really believe that that is the right option for people, but it may not be the right option for all people, okay? So I would just wanna give you the freedom to navigate that conversation with your care team, hire that doula, um, loop in the, the people around you that you feel like are supportive and can listen and help you process those feelings. Ultimately, they are your decision to make. Um, and no matter which way and route you go, the key here is, is that you feel informed and empowered by that decision, and then you can strategize based on which way you decide to go. I would love to hear how it goes for you. Um, keep us posted. Rotate your posterior baby, baby for a faster labor. Jennifer Sider says, um, hi Sarah, thanks for making this video. Can I do this at 36 weeks or will it put me into labor early? Great question. I want to turn my posterior sunny side up baby, but I'm afraid to put myself into labor before I should. You cannot put yourself into labor, okay? This goes for engaged baby, this goes for all my OP videos, this goes for all my peanut ball videos, positioning for labor, for a faster labor. None of those techniques will put you into labor. If you happen to do them and go into labor, your body was right there, okay? And this I feel so strongly about, I could just like shout it from the rooftops because all of you, how many of you, and you can let us know down below too, like I tried all the things and nothing worked. And then all of a sudden I just took a nap and I was in labor, right? So this is where you cannot force yourself into labor, okay? Obviously, like if you're being induced, that's another story, but the goal would be to set up your structures so that your body can do the work. Your body does so many things that have to align in order to go into labor on their own. The goal is supporting the body, getting that baby rotated and twisted so that they can settle into the pelvis, put pressure on the cervix, but you could have the lowest baby in the world and still go to 42 weeks. Flex and flow, again, I've seen this so many times, um, but don't be stressed, try all the things. And if you happen to go into labor, then great. And really, if you happen to go into labor by 37 weeks and beyond, you're still considered term and we assume all is well with your baby. Mm, Samira says, what if I get muscle cramps on my legs? What should I do while I'm in active labor? Right now I'm only two centimeters dilated and in pain, please advise. So muscle cramps are likely two of my top things. Again, it could be something else. Always talk to your provider on this one. But muscle cramps probably mean a magnesium deficiency or lack of hydration or both. So drink some water, have some electrolyte water. You can take, if you're at home and like she's clear, she might even be in labor. If she's in labor, then obviously you're not taking magnesium while in labor, but magnesium rich foods are gonna help you to set yourself up to avoid those muscle cramps because that is an increased risk while you are pregnant. Risk comparison of a cesarean versus vaginal birth. This comes from Ragged Yen Red. She says, what are your thoughts on waiting to have a C-section after labor begins versus scheduling a C-section? Does doing so help with initiating breastfeeding, less problems with bleeding? Are there any downsides? Thanks. Okay, I'm going to summarize heavily here, okay? Because again, this could be full video. And I see Brian rolling his eyes in the background because I'm very bad at summarizing, okay? So in general, this is a conversation to have with your provider because there are certain conditions that require a C-section that are not safe for labor, okay? Placenta previa is the first one on my mind, but flex and flow, okay? In the case that you have a condition or you're a repeat C-section, there is actually benefit to going into labor on your own because of the hormones that are released in labor. Now, does that mean that you go through all of labor and, you know, wait till the very end? No, but you're waiting for the initiation of labor as the hormones switch, which can help with breastfeeding, that can help with recovery, it can help with bonding, etc. So, um Again, conversation for your provider, but just to throw it out there as like another option for you or something if you're interested in, see if that's an option or if that's something you're interested in if your doctor feels like that's a safe option given your pregnancy because there is actually benefit from the hormones of labor. 
That is all I have for you today. Thank you so much for submitting your questions, for asking your questions. Just so you know, I do see your comments. I scroll through them almost always daily. I may not get to respond, but know they are being seen by someone likely. If you have other questions, you can comment down below. I will come back to this video and pull from this video for a future coffee and questions. Make sure you follow me over on Instagram. There's more education, more support, more fun things happening over there. My links to my website, and websites if you're a labor and delivery nurse are in the description box down below as well. I also have like Amazon lists where I'm constantly putting new fun products that I'm finding either for pregnancy, labor, birth, life, even for my life. Nurses, you have a list over there, so make sure you check that out as well. I have childbirth classes, labor support, all the things you need for the most confident labor, birth, pregnancy, parenting journey. I am here for you. Thank you so much for being here. And then until next time, don't forget to flex and flow, and I will see you soon. Bye.